So today, Persist is honored to host an expert panel discussion on the topic of EEG electrical source imaging with three of the top experts in the field. My name is Marie Terrell, and I am the Director of Product Management with Persist. It is my pleasure to introduce this webinar along with our panel of experts with you today, which we hope will generate positive and useful discussion within the EEG community around the topic of EEG electrical source imaging and its practical implementation implementation for clinical use in pre-surgical epilepsy evaluations. For over 30 years, Persist has been committed to advancing the field of EEG detection and trending for clinical environments. Our motivation for hosting this discussion on ESI today is we have come to understand through feedback and discussion with customers that there is strong evidence that ESI now achieves high levels of accuracy and contributes meaningfully to pre-surgical surgical epilepsy evaluations. However, despite this, regular adoption into routine hospital workflow remains low. In response to this, our goal at Persist is to make ESI more readily available as a practical tool for our customers through a new offering called Persist ESI powered by Epilogue. The aim for today's webinar is to hear from these three experts regarding their practical experience with EEG electrical source imaging including some key successes and challenges with implementation at their respective institutions and the direction they would like to see the field take from here. We hope this will be a learning opportunity and a way to share and compare experiences. Each speaker will present for about 15 minutes and then we will follow with 15 minutes of live Q&A. The session is being recorded if you need to leave early and we will be sending a link to all attendees and also those who were absent afterwards. So today I present to you our panel speakers, Dr. Stefan Schuli, Professor of Neurology at the Feinberg School of Medicine and head of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Program at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. Our second speaker is Dr. Stefan Bickel, Assistant Professor of Neurology and Neurosurgery at Northwell Health in New York City. And Dr. Leonardo Bonilla, Professor of Neurology and Director of both the Epilepsy Division and the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. And without further ado, I present to you Dr. Stefan Schuli. Ah, wait. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get started, I do want to say that, sorry, Dr. Schuli, that the opinions and viewpoints of each speaker are solely their own and do not represent Persist or any other commercial entity or commercial interest. The content presented today by each speaker was not prepared or edited by Persist. Neither is Persist providing any form of payment or compensation for the time today of each speaker. Speaker participation in this webinar is solely voluntary. And now we're ready for you, Dr. Shuli. Thank you. Let me see if I can advance the slides. Uh, or otherwise, I will, yeah, I think you have to do that for me. Um, yeah, thanks for having me today. I think uh, next slide, please. Um, here we go. Yeah, this is a beautiful view from uh, the Hancock Tower from Chicago. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. I have a couple of uh, speaker bro engagements. Um, there is no honorarium for this for this talk, and I, the slides are provided for me. The only relevant conflict of interest I probably have this afternoon is, is that Bayern Munich is playing in the Champions League, but they already won the first game 4-1, so should be okay. Uh, next slide, please. So as a brief introduction to the to the whole topic, obviously what we're talking about is um, uh, the refinement of uh, a workup for epilepsy surgery. Um, as you know, um, that when we do, particularly for phase one evaluations, a, our uh, pre-surgical evaluation includes a, an MRI and a neuropsychological testing. It includes a detailed history of the patient's semiology. We do uh, routinely a scalp video EEG recording and we, um, uh, look for eloquent cortex by it, it asking the patient for handedness, uh, neuropsychology testing, and functional MI as part of a routine phase one. Um, but one area we're going to focus today is the uh, irritative area, the irritative zone defined by the interacral uh, epileptiform discharges on the EEG and how uh, uh, electrical source imaging uh, can help to further refine that in our pre surgical evaluation. Next slide. You know, when it comes to the irritative zone, um, it's, it's, uh, it is interesting that we, we all agree that 
the location of the interictal spike on surface EEG um, is probably more localizing than the seizure onset, which is something uh, already representing often a, a propagation of uh, epileptiform activity. But still, on the other hand, we know that um, the uh, 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 even the spike we see on surface usually includes a relatively large area intracranially of about six centimeters um, in order to be seen on, on the surface. And we also know that um, when we do invasive recordings that the interictal um, area is often more extensive than the ictal onset zone um, on scalp. So the reverse basically what we see often on, on scalp recording. And the question is, um, you know, is there in, in the times of stereo EG and invasive recording and uh, stereotactic surgery and laser ablation, is it uh, sufficient to just have a two dimensional voltage map of the interactive activity on the surface, or is there a value of actually getting uh, a model uh, understanding the potential source of the interactive EG signal which we record on the scalp? There have been a number of papers coming out using uh, what we talked about today. Uh, the an automatic uh, um, source, source imaging tool, uh, Epilog, um, finding that uh, if you look at, at that in surgical management conferences, that in about a third of patients, Epilog makes a significant impact on the decision um, and, and planning for, for epilepsy surgery. There can be a different counseling of the patient. There can be the decision between a single uh, stage or uh, uh, second stage procedure um, they can that can impact where you place your electrodes, um, either uh, intraoperatively or extraoperatively. And then obviously there's also new, new uh, studies showing that the dense clusters which are completely receptive are, are related to better outcome um, in uh, certain patients. Next slide. This is the, uh, the epilogue workflow. So you take long-term uh, EEG data, you uh, identified spike clusters. You use the patient's own uh, preoperative MRI um, and do uh, source imaging. You create a report. And then in this study, there was, a, was, a, was the, 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 the um, authors looked if how that um, actually uh, correlated with the patient's uh, resection on postoperative MRI and ultimately outcome. Um, when we do automatic spike detection with epilogue, um, keep in mind that we uh, get by, by the report four clusters. Um, we typically do source uh, analysis at the half rising or peak time, and we usually focus just on one uh, on the predominant uh, uh, cluster um, with the most common uh, with the most uh, frequent detections. Next slide. This is the Northwestern workflow, and uh, that was certainly a work of uh, six months to get that implemented. And uh, so I will not go over all the pains we had to go through. But um, we originally thought about uh, doing epilogue as uh, on the basis of an outpatient EEG. So we could potentially build up on the EEG. We would discharge the patient from the EMU. And then we quick, quickly realized that actually the, one of the biggest uh, benefits of uh, using uh, epilogue is the, the ability to uh, look at long-term EEG data. So we started to use actually our uh, EMU data one to all four days um, uh, to, to, for analysis, um, averaging a, a large number of uh, interactal spikes. We do have a surgical coordinator, which I think is instrumental in making this all work. So she will get, while we do EMU runs, she will get the order we want source imaging. She will uh, inform the patient that we will do that and that we will build the insurance. Um, she will uh, notify the, uh, she will in initiate the insurance process and write a predetermination note in, in our medical health uh, record system. She will also notify a person in radiology to give us the MRI uh, data we need and also reach out to one of our uh, senior techs uh, to give us the specific EEG segment we want to uh, submit. The EEG tech then uh, uh, creates a folder with the uh, patient's raw EEG, um, notifies our coordinator, and the coordinator uploads the MRI as well as the EEG to the Epilog website. Um, once the result is uh, uh, generated, which usually takes about a day, um, we get notified, um, we get a PDF report of the technical uh, analysis, 
we attached that, that to the pre-existing uh, epilog node in our medical uh, record system. And then uh, our coordinator forwards that to the uh, epileptologist, the primary epileptologist, so the epileptologist who sent the patient initially to the EMU and initiated the pre-surgical workup. And that physician creates the actual uh, billable um, uh, procedure note. Um, the, the, as you know, uh, one of the obstacles of source imaging is, is that there's only a single uh, code which can either be applied to the technician or the, or the physician, which is 95957. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, uh, later during, during this presentation. What is the role of the physician? So we, we thought about for a while, you know, we don't have any, anyone who does active research in source imaging like uh, Dr. Bickel and Dr. Bonilla. Um, but we are all surgically trained epileptologists. And at the end, um, when you get the report, uh, I think a lot of that is uh, common sense. So you get four populations. 95% of the time, the predominant population is the one you are actually selecting um, and is concordant with the spike population you, you identified by visual analysis. Um, then the second step is that you have to decide if you want to analyze that on, a, on the onset of the spike at the half rising, which is typically what we use, or at the full, um, at the peak. Um, and then after you made that selection, you asked, uh, you, you write a report basically um, determining if what, what the automatic spike detection generated makes sense in the context of, of your patient's evaluation. Um, there's been a couple of caveats when we did this first. Um, I noticed that my the fellows thought that the spike detection, which was provided by Epilog or uh, Persist, is actually replacing your visual analysis. So they, when I asked them what's the spike count on the patient, they would actually give me the automatic spike detection, which is often um, quite inaccurate. Um, they also didn't really realize that you have to pick one of the spike population and they actually have to fit, fit your clinical picture. Um, one of the other caveats, which was difficult, is, is that Epilog gave us automatically the whole 6,000 slices of DICOM with all the four different um, uh, spike population at the various stages of uh, onset, half rising, and peak time. Um, and then we had to kind of sort through these, this uh, enormous amount of data. Um, so we kind of changed the workflow and uh, asked them to really only give us the result of our pre-selected um, clinically most significant um, spike population uh, at a particular time as a DICOM solution. Next slide. For what do we use um, Epilog? So we use it routinely on every, any patient with focal spikes in the EMU. Um, because I think it's often very difficult to make a distinction between a diagnostic and a pre-surgical evaluation in the EMU. And many patients who where you who are sent for diagnostic actually end up being a pre-surgical candidate down the line. So if you think we, we kind of start with everybody. Obviously for the patients who are in, uh, making the decision that they do under one, under, uh, want to undergo surgery, it becomes more uh, most important. Um, we find that um, it is most helpful for planning of intraoperative ECOG. Where do you, where do you place your grids? Um, it's obviously very, very difficult sometimes. It is also, we also use it for making a decision between uh, patients who have selective uh, laser ablation of the hippocampus versus the standard anterior temporal resection. Um, and we use it for planning of in, uh, invasive uh, monitoring, either with subdural grids, but uh, more commonly, obviously, with stereo EG. And next slide. I'm going to spend a few minutes of presenting actually two very typical cases for, for uh, the use of uh, electrical source imaging. This is a 38-year-old uh, male who had a very classical history of um, what we thought was probably an infection with neurocysticercosis. He's Hispanic origin, and he had an episode of uh, fever and headache um, in his, uh, in, in, while he was still living in Mexico, uh, which was shortly followed uh, a month or two ago, uh, later by, uh, by seizures. Um, the headache and the um, and fever actually resolved with uh, the application of steroids and treatment for neurocystic psychosis. Um, he developed subsequently intractable epilepsy and he has seizures, which he's often not quite aware of, um, with staring and automatisms, which sometimes progress into uh, generalized convulsions. Next slide. During our pre-surgical evaluation, you can see that the patient had 
um, mid-temporal uh, spikes, which are actually slightly more prominent over the basal temporal electrochain F, F7, uh, F9, T9, P9, than over the mid-temporal chain, which we typically place for 1020 system. And you can also see that during his habitual seizures, he had a more neocortical appearing um, uh, rhythmic delta pattern at, uh, at the onset. Next slide. He had a um, quite prominent uh, neocortical um, uh, lesion on the left uh, mid temporal gyrus, as you can see, uh, which showed some uh, calcification on CAT scan um, and otherwise um, symmetric looking hippocampi on both sides. Next slide. He did have um, what one could have interpreted as a, a verbal memory uh, decline and, and, and verbal uh, speech problems. Um, next slide. Um, so in summary, he had a very typical left temporal lobe epilepsy um, with uh, seizures, complex partial seizures or dialeptic seizures as we call them, um, with a single intric left uh, spike population and ictal onset which pointed to be um, uh, temporal um, and a calcified cyst over the mid-temporal gyrus and the mid hypermetabolism on, on PET scan, which was a little bit more diffuse, including not only the lateral uh, temporal cortex, but also basal and mesial structures. And uh, the neuropsychological testing at the end was not felt to be quite significant, given that he had, uh, that English was his uh, second language. Um, and the neuropsychologist wasn't quite sure how much that may have impacted his uh, memory performance and uh, speech production. Next slide. So looking at the um, at, uh, at, the pre at his uh, functional cortex, we did a functional MRI, which showed that you had a, a speech activation just about one centimeter behind the uh, uh, lesion on the MRI scan. And during the debate, if this warrants a subtle good evaluation, the surgeon felt that as long as the, he's not required to get come anywhere closer to that, uh, to that lesion, or, or extend the resection beyond the posterior margin of the lesion um, that the patient would actually be, um, that one would be able to do a, a single stage uh, procedure and that an awake resection would not be necessary. So the first question is, do we really know if the spike extends uh, posteriorly? The second question uh, comes obviously from the epilepsy itself. The patient has epilepsy for almost 20 years. Um, and there are uh, re reports showing with neurocystic acosis that there are obviously often um, secondary epileptogenicity, either with surrounding cortical dysplasia um, or actually in the mesial involvement um, where a hipp hippocampectomy is necessary to render the patient seizure free. Next slide. So these were the two questions we had for epilog. Uh, number one, is there a clear evidence for mesial temporal involvement? Um, which in our center, which then required radar testing and additional testing to see if we really can remove the hippocampus. And second, um, what's the, how large is the epileptogenic zone surrounding the lesion and is the, does it go more posterior, um, warranting potentially a, an awake uh, resection? Next slide. Again, what I already mentioned, we had a predominant uh, uh, irritative uh, cortex or spike population over T9, uh, mid-temple, as you already saw in the routine EEG or, or long-term, uh, and the visual inspection of the long-term EEG recording. And then the second population, which also looked uh, epilepto epileptogenic, um, which uh, was maximum a little bit more uh, anterior. And then you had uh, a right-sided uh, detection, which probably are artifact or physiologic uh, transients. Next slide. Again, it is very important to actually look at the spike detection. They obviously only give you an example of 10, but it, uh, it gives you an idea how many of the spikes you're detecting are actually uh, two epileptogenic uh, discharges versus uh, EKG artifacts or muscle artifacts or other things. Obviously, you will never get a completely pure sample, but you can get by that brief sample a relatively good idea um, about the variability of the spikes and, um, and what what the source imaging is actually analyzing. Next slide. 
And then again, I think in this case, uh, if you look at if you look too early, you have a too too big of a dispersion and big uh, variability of your spike populations. You most most of the time we actually choose a, the half rising um, time of the spike um, to do our um, analysis or, or pick our our uh, our results. Um, as you can see, you can have a you have a source estimation of the average spike spike population on on the uh, on the upper row. Uh, which uh, indicates a basal temporal um, uh, involvement, and you have a spike population which is different from what you, what you see, would see in a mesial uh, temporal lobe epilepsy, and I can show that on the next example, uh, which is uh, which shows some mesial temporal involvement, but also um, basal temporal uh, a, a large population over the basal temporal region. So a little bit unexpected, certainly not posterior to the lesion, um, but certainly also not just uh, perilesional. Um, and uh, implicating the basal temporal area. Next slide. This is at the peak. So obviously at the peak, you get a more denser cluster. You can see that now the spike population is more hom homogeneous, uh, implicating the basal temporal area as the primary source. Um, and again, that the same applies to the, um, the, the heat map um, on the upper row. Next slide. We decided to put uh, to to pursue with ECOG. Um, you may argue if that was the right decision, and I'll tell you about the results in the OR. So we decided that we would place a two by six grid over the lesion. We would place a, a one by six or one by eight strip, uh, which would go around the temporal tip, uh, covering the hippocampus to distinguish mesial temporal spikes. And we would place a, a two by six, uh, moving it back and forth over the basal temporal region. The patient had uh, exactly what 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 Epilog had showed. It actually did have a basal temporal um, uh, spike population, which was very very frequent, um, which uh, led us to do a resection of the lesion, including uh, the basal temporal area, um, sparing the hippocampus. You may argue, uh, knowing that that uh, the interoperative finding, it may may well be that this was not. Uh, not enough. Uh, we did post-operative ECOG, um, and there were the spike population was significantly reduced and verified, um, but was still present and not completely absent. Um, so we'll see how that the patient does. I still think that for a patient with a clear lesion um, and uh, with a, a relatively normal-looking hippocampus, a first step of doing a function sparing a neocortical resection um, without taking out the dominant left temporal lobe, a uh, mesial temporal uh, structures. Um, is a very, very reasonable first step. Next slide. Probably the second most common indication for um, epilog at our center is the question about um, if a patient is a candidate for a selective uh, laser ablation versus a standard anterior temporal resection. You can ask, you know, what's the best way to determine that? Is it the habitual OR? Is it the PET finding being really limited to the mesial structure? Is it the presence of a clear-cut mesial temporal sclerosis on MRI without any evidence that there could be a, a dual pathology? Um, is it the nickel spect which helps you to make that distinction? Um, for us, I think uh, Epilog is certainly a big player in, um, in determining if you think that the patient um, could, could, uh, could go with a laser ablation first and see how it goes. Um, obviously, in addition to having a lesion on MRI. Um, the, this is a 29-year-old uh, right-handed female with left temporal lobe epilepsy with a very typical kind of uh, psychic OR followed by lyoleptic seizures occasionally by generalized tonic-clonic convulsions. Again, who's uh, medically intractable having failed uh, half a dozen of seizure medications. Next slide. Her interictal and ictal studies show that she had uh, a more anterior temporal spikes, anterior mid temporal spikes over F7, T7. Um, and you can see that she has a rhythmic uh, theta pattern over the left temporal region, uh, obs somewhat obscured by a muscle artifact. Next. And, and a um, subtle but uh, obvious uh, mesial temporal sclerosis in, on the MRI um, on the left side. Next slide. Again, the indication in this patient was uh, taking everything together, including neuropsychological testing, um, was the question, are we satisfied with having interictal findings, a lesion on MRI, um, 
and everything else being very consistent with the mesial temporal lobe epilepsy, or would she need an invasive evaluation and or and or a, an extensive uh, anterior temporal resection? Our next slide. Again, there is a clearly uh, uh, a dominant cluster with over 3,000 uh, uh, averages over F9. Um, there, are, uh, there are probably physiologic transients which were averaged over T10 um, as well as F8 um, and also over P9. Um, so you're focusing or you, you're deciding that F9 is really the area you want to see the source. Um, next slide. And again, uh, I, I left out the, the uh, examples of the singles, but they all look ep epileptiform. Um, and you can see that they, it, at the end, it averaged uh, maximum over F9, F7. If you look at the half rising uh, time, you can see that there's a very, very dense cluster around the measles, uh, around the measles structures, quite dis distinctly different from what you've seen um, in the patient with neocortical epilepsy and basal temporal involvement. Um, and uh, Given those, these findings, she actually went ahead and had a laser ablation. Um, next slide. The, here you can see that the cluster gets even denser if you actually go for the peak time, but I think in this case, I would have chosen uh, the uh, half rising time for analysis. Next slide. So in summary, I think electrical source imaging is becoming more and more useful, um, particularly as we get more selective with our procedures, um, as, we, as we kind of think about patients more functionally and stereotactically um, in our uh, uh, ablation or, or invasive uh, recordings. Um, the, it has been validated um, and, and is using the patient's own uh, MRI. Um, it is uh, really beneficial that you can actually use your standard routine uh, EMU recording, including sphenoidal electrodes or additional subtemporal electrodes if, as you place them uh, to, to, for analysis. Um, it uh, allows the outsourcing of signal processing, so you really don't have to have uh, in-house expertise uh, for doing the, um, the signal analysis. Um, and I think one of the downsides, and which I think I hope will be changed, is that we there are often there are sometimes patients where you really only have a very rare spikes, um, and you really would like to be able to sample those spikes individually and manually yourself, and then submit them. Um, I think that would really a big would be a big uh, advancement over the uh, automatic detection, which is currently available, which is probably sufficient for ninety percent of the patients. But there's a patient population where we, we didn't submit for epilogue because we really didn't feel that the, the, the epileptic form activity was so rare and, um, and it would not be uh, adequately uh, picked out by an automatic detection. Next slide. The other thing which is uh, hopefully happening a little bit more seamlessly in the future, and I think Dr. Bickel and Dr. Bonilla will talk about that, is the integration with ICTL recording and also the co-registration with the DICOM images, which obviously would be great for the surgeon to actually have um, as they do their pre-surgical planning, uh, co-registered to all the other information we're collecting from the, from the patient. Uh, that's all I wanted to talk about. I look forward to the other two speakers and I will um, pass on. Thank you, Dr. Shuley, for that great talk. We're going to just move right ahead. And our next speaker is Dr. Stefan Bickel. Thank you, Dr. Bickel. All right, hello, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary, uh, um, for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, maybe you can go to the next slide already. So I don't have any conflicts of interest. Um, sometimes I test some new tools that are coming out from Epilogue and persist, but uh, I provide uh, feedback, but I don't uh, get compensated for that. Next slide, please. So I was asked um, to give a brief um, experience report um, from our point of view as a sort of a recent adapter of electrical source imaging at our center. Um, Dr. Shuli already made uh, many uh, good points that I also will mention here uh, once again, but uh, my main focus uh, will be that um, on describing on how we ended up with the solution that we're currently using, what our current workflow is as well, which is a little bit different, but not too much from 
what uh, Dr. Shire was describing and also with um, what I see uh, could be useful in the future. What's uh, sort of a uh, wish list? If you could go to the next slide, please. So um, the history of uh, ESID, our institution, uh, how did we end up with the current solution? Our experience is um, uh, pretty recent. Um, we started using clinical uh, low density EG recordings uh, to uh, um, do source localization approximately one year ago using that log platform as well. Uh, before that, we didn't have any uh, ESI electrical source imaging capabilities. Uh, we did, um, like many other centers also, we, send, uh, we would send out selected patients for MEG recordings and uh, spike source localization um, at other institutions, but that has not been, uh, that has often been helpful, but uh, not every uh, uh, patient uh, was able to travel to these locations and also um, for patients that only had rare discharges, it was obviously not that helpful because the recordings were short. In terms of ESI, though, although we didn't have any capabilities at the time, uh, both my uh, director of the epilepsy uh, uh, center here, Dr. Lado uh, at North Shore, and I, we both had positive experiences in the past with this approach. Um, Dr. Lado, he actually used a, he acquired an additional EG system and in his previous institution, and he would analyze the data himself with uh, dedicated uh, software. From my point of view, I had experience during my fellowship, uh, and it was one of our duties also to help with interictal ESI studies that were uh, recorded both uh, as outpatient and in the inpatient uh, um, scenario. Um, but also uh, during my fellowship, there was also using basically a, a separate EG recording system um, and analysis software, which, which I mean that it was uh, software. There were tools that we didn't use for the usual clinical recordings. Uh, so I was telling this story about our prior experiences because um, uh, just to show that uh, we both of us are definitely positively inclined towards the method and we're trying to find a way to get it implemented um, at our um, center. Uh, however, we didn't have a, a separate recording system and uh, we were thinking for quite some time how we could make this work. Uh, we were thinking of how we could acquire a separate system, how we can sort of implement the parallel stream of EG recordings, and also importantly, how we could organize um, to get additional time that's needed to um, uh, for some dedicated technologists, fellows, or attendings to learn how to acquire and then also to, how to analyze the data. Unfortunately, that didn't work out for us uh, this way, but it led us to start using ESI on the clinical recordings. Uh, and uh, additionally, um, by using out, uh, outsourcing of the actual analysis. Um, and after initial trial phase, uh, we, we stuck with it and we uh, were, um, you know, we're continuing to use it up to now. Um, so far we have been using this approach mainly for clinical purposes um, to localize the discharges. Uh, our current goal is to run it on all the pre-surgical patients that have interictal discharges, of course, and then to discuss them in the weekly surgical epilepsy conferences. It's a goal that we haven't quite reached yet, but we're working on it, and I think we're we are getting, we getting there. Um, we haven't used this specific approach yet for research projects, but I'm uh, excited. I think we uh, will, I hope that it will uh, change soon and that we can start projects uh, both for localizing um, epileptic uh, activity, but also um, I would be uh, very excited to start um, some possible projects um, to see if it's uh, if this approach works for functional mapping as well. So what is our current workflow? If you could go to the next slide. So it's still a somewhat a work in progress, as uh, uh, Dr. Shiri also mentioned. Uh, uh, it takes some time to get uh, as, um, the initial kink sort of smoothened out. Um, and I just want to mention again how important I think that is to have a smooth smooth workflow because it's it's really in our experience uh, it can really stand in the way of not using the, the this method as routinely as you might want if uh, there uh, if it's getting complicated to get this data recorded and analyzed. 
So what didn't work so well, uh, the initially the workflow that we had was that um, we would identify the EEG data, um, selected patients that would be good candidates for ESI. Then usually uh, the attending or fellow on service, if it was a me, they would communicate this to me. Then we, together with the fellow, we would identify the as with a data set and then upload ideally a 24 hour recording with a lot of uh, interictal discharges. Uh, we would we basically would export the identified data to the hospital server, then log into the Epilog cloud on, uh, per browser, and then upload the data. Then we'd update our databases in RedCap and Excel sheets. Um, on the imaging side, we would identify a good T1 scan with enough uh, spatial resolution that has a big enough field of view, et cetera, then order the study from the film library. Uh, and then usually members of the lab had somehow get involved there to help with extracting uh, the scans that are really needed, uh, the identifying them and then uploading uh, with the Epilog cloud uh, to the Epilog cloud. So although it wasn't super complicated, um, it did involve several different people and different software platforms, which made it somewhat time consuming. So what are we doing? Now, what works better is, so all again, we're still in the transition phase here, um, but uh, we did uh, streamline some of the processes. I mean, one thing definitely is that uh, after the identification of a good data set, um, that um, um, we can have the fellow directly download the, uh, the images from PAX. And then we have uh, been made available a new tool that already is, I believe, or it will be soon integrated in Epilogue Persist that uh, allows to choose uh, specific scans uh, from this downloaded MRI series that we can then di directly upload to that tool and to the cloud. Um, similarly, the uh, um, tool can uh, have access to our EG database. Uh, we can then select and upload the identified uh, data directly uh, through that tool. So uh, I want to make um, just basically through these things, I just want to make the point that uh, an interface that sort of reduces the amount of software platforms that need to be used, uh, which minimizes the people that need to be involved, uh, that, that significantly helps, uh, which is not too surprising, but I just wanted to make that point. Um, also, what I want to mention is that to date, we mostly uploaded the full data sets and the uh, following processing was fully automated by, uh, you know, the uh, um, epilog. It's convenient, but uh, particularly for the ID detection part, as Dr. Shide also mentioned, um, it's really high on my list that we can, uh, that we implement, that we run the ID detector on site, and then that we can go through the um, detected um, um, discharges and discard artifacts or um, just uh, clearly false detections. Um, what happens after the upload. Um, once uh, the, uh, we get the, uh, the results back, I generate the report and I think Dr. Bonilla will talk more about how the results and the reports can look like. Uh, I will upload the report to EMR and then the secretary bills for the digital analysis of the EG. Um, I would then send out the reports to the fellows and the attendings that were involved and uh, we selected cases that were then discussed in the surgical conference. And uh, so although this has, hasn't happened really routinely yet on every case, I am optimistic that we can do that, uh, get it implemented um, going forward, that we do that more routinely. So uh, in summary, um, as I mentioned, um, it has been a bit challenging at times initially to get the, uh, the data collection upload going smoothly, but uh, many, um, so these helper tools have really helped us a great deal. Um, once the results come back, and uh, I think I and um, the fellows and, and, and everyone that has been involved with these, I think they found them useful first, educationally for sure. Um, and but then they also they they did help us increase or decrease our uh, confidence uh, in what we thought were eight long sets uh, based on just visual inspection. And in the cases where we did already have SEG done after the ESI, we did have good uh, co-localization of those interictal discharges. Um, how much the ESI results actually do change the clinical decision-making during the surgical conferences. At our center specifically, I think we, it's still a little bit early to say, we do need some more experience. 
but given the initial experience that we do have and the published data that uh, was mentioned already, um, I'm very optimistic that it will be a helpful tool, particularly, I think, for us for uh, helping guide implementation locations of electrodes. Um, if you could go to the next slide. So if I start now listing where I think the field could be going and what uh, could be on the wish list, um, again, I think there's uh, been several developments that uh, will hopefully make it a lot easier for epilepsy centers to adopt uh, ESI uh, if they want to. Um, so this hopefully will lead to a more widespread use. And uh, um, so because I do think that so far it has probably been difficult to implement uh, without having maybe a research team backing up parts of the process or having a very dedicated clinician uh, with motivation and time to spend on this. Um, I mentioned some of these tools that I think uh, will facilitate this process, uh, you know, the automated and semi-automated ID detection, uh, the outsourcing of the signal processing, if a center chooses to do so, and also the helper tools. Um, but uh, probably one of the biggest points um, that I feel are important here is really uh, the um, possible use of clinical recordings, which has made the option of ESI much more uh, uh, feasible. So that brings me more to the wish list uh, part, and uh, several points have already been uh, raised by Dr. Schule. Um, but first of all, I'm hoping is that if there is more widespread use of the um, this uh, approach, that this will follow with more and uh, bigger clinical studies, which will hopefully help us with establish. Um, the usefulness, um, particularly on different use cases uh, with uh, ESI, low density recordings, with uh, how um, uh, accurate are those in, uh, uh, for deep sources versus superficial sources, insular midline structures, uh, et cetera. Then also high on the list is uh, the uh, having a robust and accurate digital source localization solution uh, that have been um, Several solutions do exist, and um, um, they. Um, um, I just feel like that if um, we would all really benefit if uh, these approaches could um, be um, established, which specific approach is most accurate, and then having a seamless integration in in, in the workflow that would be extremely useful. Then as well, uh, integration of the sources. Um, the integral sources into surgical planning software would be on my list. Uh, well, to a large extent, this can be done through uh, research protocols, at least at our center, and I'm sure at, at several other centers too. Uh, just some more standardized and seamless options would be good as well. And as a last point um, I want to raise here is that it would be great to establish also how useful this approach would be um, a specific, this specific analysis approach will be uh, for functional mapping purposes for language and ideally at some point uh, for memory functions. I know, uh, I mean, there's been excellent research already available from uh, EEG and uh, particularly MEG uh, studies with um, um, a few examples that I um, put on the slides here. But uh, I'm very curious to see if uh, it is um, possible that uh, uh, this specific approach here can be of further use. Um, implementing this, uh, including um, uh, again in a, in, a, in a sort of a seamless clinical work will be extremely valuable. So this is, uh, I'll leave it at that. And uh, yeah, thank you again very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to uh, the discussions later on. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Beckel, for that presentation. Um, we're going to move forward now with Dr. Bonilia. I will say that we are um, a little compressed for time, but I do think it's important that we hear from Dr. Bonilla. So we'll um, we'll get through and do the Q and A after. So hopefully, those of you that had questions will be able to stay. There's already some good questions coming in that I hope that we can get to. So, uh, without further ado, our last but not least speaker for today, Dr. Bonilla. Thank you very much, Ms. Tero. It's truly a pleasure to be participating in this webinar. I appreciate the kind invitation. Before I start, let me just ask a quick question. Can you see my camera? It's not showing up on my side, but if you can see it, it's fine. Yes, yes we Perfect. can see it. 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you again for organizing this webinar. It's truly a pleasure. It's an honor to be participating in particular alongside Dr. Shuley and Dr. Bickel. Um, truly, truly uh, an honor. So I will be speaking about integrating the electrical source imaging into the diagnostic epilepsy workflow. So my topic here is not so much about the scientific um, value of electrical source imaging, but more about the practical aspects about utilizing this new technology in the context of a clinical workflow and what are challenges and caveats and um, what are uh, potential aspects within the workflow that um, in our experience have been very important to be attentive to. Um, if you can kindly move to the next slide, Marie, please. Perfect. So um, I do receive research support from the NIH as it's listed here. I do not have a partnership with industry regarding research at the moment. Uh, next slide, Marie, please. And I don't have any conflicts of interest associated with this presentation. As you heard, this is a webinar that was that is hosted by Epilog, uh, excuse me, by Persist. Nonetheless, um, I am not a consultant for an EG company or for an EG equipment. Um, this is not a paid talk. The slide content is our own. So this is really just a candid discussion about electro source imaging or ESI for brevity in the context of a um, um, uh, clinical workflow. Um, to uh, provide more information in my institution, the, our hospital has a contract with the following uh, tools. So Persist, Epilog, Philips, um, and or MagStim um, and Compumatic. So these are all tools that we use currently on a regular basis. And none of what I'll discuss today is an advertisement or endorsement for any particular um, company. It's really just a discussion about what are the, the, the potential uses of ESI. And as you can see, several of the things that I'll mention can be done by different vendors, et cetera. So it's really just a discussion about ESI itself. So again, I appreciate Persist putting this together. So it's great for us to have this uh, opportunity. Uh, Marie, if you can kindly move to the next slides, please. Excellent. So the outline here for these uh, final minutes, I'll talk a little bit about the complexity involved in generating an efficient workflow regarding ESI, the balance between innovation and practical aspects, and I'll give an example of our existing workflow, which is very similar to what Dr. Shuli and Dr. Bick already presented. We have an experience, we have experience here at, at MUSC of approximately seven years doing ESI, starting with uh, high density EG and more recently with um, regular EG. I'll talk a, a little bit about caveats and future wish, wishes and uh, a wish list. So next slide, please. So as you know, regarding the conventional EEG reading pipeline, right? typically that involves acquiring EEG data, the interpretation of EEG, namely reading the EEG, and then a, a standardized report based on those two steps, which is then associated with billing. Um, next slide, Marie, please. If you add ESI to the mix, then you have several other aspects that need to be taken into account. So to begin with, particularly for um, regular EEG, you get much better results with realistic head modeling, right? Using tissue segmentation. For that, you need an MRI. So you need to retrieve the clinical MRI from which tissue segmentation is done. And that generates the forward and inverse modeling that combined with EEG generates the ESI results. Those results then need to be interpreted by the physician. They need to be read, just like a regular EEG is read, you know, you're reading the ESI results, which then go into a standardized physician report that is then associated with billing. So there's several new aspects in the workflow that are associated with ESI. Uh, so I wanna focus a little bit on, the, on, on these new and different aspects compared to regular EEG reading. Um, next slide, please. So if you think about that corner there, next slide, please. MRI retrieval, tissue segmentation, forward inverse modeling, and ESI results are all things that need to happen and they can be done locally. They can, you can absolutely do that at your institution using local resources. And I'll talk a little bit about what each and every one of those steps entail and what are the, the advantages and disadvantages of doing this locally using you know, your own tools. Um, next slide, please. So if you consider MRI retrieval, that means finding a clinical MRI that has the appropriate sequence, namely an isotropic T1 acquisition that involves most of the head and the face. Um, so that entails having access to the PACS system, namely where the images are stored. Typically this process is done in our institution by our own neurophysiology team. So that means integrating our access to PACS access. As you know, usually EEG is not stored in PACS, so we usually don't work with PACS. So that means creating that bridge with the PACS system. 
Um, personnel needs to be trained to find those scans, to identify the scans that are appropriate. Um, there is a degree of quality control. You gotta make sure the T1 acquisition is good for, for this purpose. It doesn't have thick slices, et cetera. Um, and then downloading the images, storing the images somewhere and then sending to wherever the, the source reconstruct, the tissue reconstruction is gonna be done. So even with good training, all that process, including downloading the images, taking the time to have a client, a pack client that is working, usually revolves around 30 minutes. Next slide, please. The next steps are very time consuming and require a lot of interaction. And that means the tissue segmentation into a realistic head model. And that essentially means separating the tissues in the head, namely scalp, skull, meninges, CSF, gray matter, white matter, et cetera, so that you can calculate how electricity and magnetic fields can be distributed based on the orientation that is individualized, right? Particularly if you're considering uh, regular EEG, that's a, that's a very important step to in increase or ins ensure the accuracy of the, the, the source imaging calculation. From that, you calculate the forward model and then you put the EEG together to calculate the inverse model and try to find where the, the, the features that are associated on, uh, that are found in EEG would then map back onto the brain. So based on the person's own tissue, if there were electroactivity somewhere, where would that look like on, on the EEG? And then you get the EEG and revert it back, right? Um, there are a few caveats related to these steps. Uh, tissue segmentation requires significant quality control. It, it entails a, a good degree of anatomical knowledge, right? You need to know how to, if the segmentation is accurate, if it's consistent, Oftentimes there are lesions in the brain, right? That's commonly the case in individuals with epilepsy. So you need to make sure the tissue segmentation is preserving the authenticity of the tissues in the context of the lesion. Um, and occasionally, more commonly than never, there is a degree of correcting. You have to go back and make sure the segmentation is appropriate, et cetera. So that in entails training, right? That entails uh, a degree of, um, of knowing the anatomy and knowing how segmentation works and making sure that the results are good. And then after that's done, there are multiple parameters, as you know, with regards to forward model calculation and inverse model calculation. So the BEM model, the FEM model, um, Loretta, S. Loretta, et cetera. So you need to choose the ones that you think are, are, are more appropriate. Um, next slide, please. And then after that, as you can imagine, you have a plethora of results, right? Because you can then try to define what each and every spike looks like in terms of their sourced imaging, what the average of spikes looks like, how many spikes are gonna put on the average, et cetera. Um, so that is a process that is time consuming and requires some degree of interpretation at each and every step, particularly the last one, when you get a lot of um, information. Can that be done at your local site? Absolutely, we've done this a lot here at MUSC. It just takes time and it takes training. And you consider then if you have trained people in your group and that person is not available on a given day or you need somebody else to do it that requires training again and the consistency of somebody doing this and if they're well trained etc is something to take into account also that's a manual process that requires interpretation and just like from everyone doing it this is prone to error right so if you have a lot of staff doing it and you don't have folks that are very well trained etc that could potentially be prone to error um, next slide please so once that's done, then it has to be read, right? And that has to be read just like an EEG would. And that is what determines what goes in the report. So once the ESI results are done, that's just the results, right? The, the physician needs to take a look and make sure that, that makes sense. Because as Dr. Shuli mentioned, and I'll show a couple of examples, you didn't make sure that this is accurate in the context of the person's own epileptiform discharges, their own anatomy, semiology, et cetera, et cetera. So next slide, please. So to give you an example, Typically, this is the overall results report that we get. We outsource it, and this is the, 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 the results that we get. So you can see these are clusters that were automatically detected as being potential epileptiform discharges and where their sources would look like or, or where they would be. So you can see the timing here. You can see the clusters. You can see the localization in a topological plot, right? That circle over there that represents the head. Next slide, please. So if you look at one of those clusters, I think that was the second one. Um, you have a sample of one of the spikes, and it's what you can see on the left and most uh, side over there. This is an AP bipolar with temporal chain, parasagittal chain, left, left, center, right, right. Um, 
And this is not a very great example um, this, the, of, of a tracing, but we know based on this, this person's EEG, this is very representative of that person's spike. It looks like that person's own spikes when we read the EEG. And if you look at the average, which is what's shown in green, that's what it looks like. So it looks like a legit spike. And that's the localization, right? So we, you know, as Dr. Shuli mentioned, we look at the half rising aspect of it. We see their location, the probabilistic location of the distribution. Um, so this looks like a legit source, medial temporal. I would have preferred to see on the right topological plot there where you see the blue and red to see a better demarcated boundary between the two. So not much red going into the blue, but overall based on the, the interpretation of this person's EEG, this looks like a, a legit spike. If you go to the next one, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, one quick thing I should mention about this. And it's nice because you get a tissue segmentation result, right? So this, these are the results of the brain. And you also get how this looks like on a person's own anatomy. So the, the colors are a bit faint here, but you can see the red, the blue, the green. And that is a map over the person's own MRI of where the spikes are more likely to be coming from, right? This is a probabilistic map, but you can kind of see where that would be. And this is great because you get this, which comes as a DICOM format, and you can upload that to PAX, and you can see the side-by-side -side in your refractory epilepsy conference, for example, in contrast with your SPAC, nuclear medicine, you know, MRI, other uh, sequences, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. But if you look at another cluster, this was cluster number four. It's pretty obvious that this is an artifact, right? This is a EKG artifact. You can see there on the left-hand side, it's pretty clear. Um, you know, very, very clear. Yeah, this was detected as a potential epileptic perform discharge on ESI results. And this is why we need to read it. Because when you read it, you know, yeah, that's clearly not an epileptic uh, discharge. So this doesn't go in the report, right? This doesn't go in a physician interpretation as being an epileptic discharge. So it's very, very, very important to have that um, critical interpretation of the results. Next slide, please. So that underscores the importance of reading and the physician report, which then obviously is associated with billing. Um, next slide, please. So to give an example of how the MR report looks like here, and I just outlined what we typically have, you would have the patient information, clinical information, acquisition information, very similar to a regular EEG report. But then we put a picture of the head model, right, of the tissue segmentation, because that's very important. That defines the quality of everything else after that. And then the methods for electrical source imaging estimation, an overview of the results. So we typically put everything that we got. These are all the results. This is all the, all the information that we got. But then we do our interpretation and say, okay, but based on all these clusters, cluster number one and two are the ones that we think are real. The other ones are not, right? So we, we define what the real findings are. And it's not uncommon that we have a report like this and none of the, the, the detected clusters are actually epileptic discharges. That's okay. And then we define, you know, that based on interpretation, based on reading, based on comparison with the EEG, these are the ones we think are epileptorian discharges. This is where they're coming from in the brain. And this is what this means, right? As opposed to, you know, sometimes we can say that there's really none of those are actually true epileptorian discharges. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide regarding future directions. I think it's important to consider this technique as being a form of electro neuroimaging, right? You get results, those results can go in DICOM format, that can go in PACS, and if you put it on PACS, you can compare it with other imaging sources, nuclear medicine, MRI, et cetera. And that's very important, right? Because that, that can give you a, a very good idea about localization. That's feasible now. You know, whether you do this locally or whether you outsource this, you can get the results in nifty format, you can save them in DICOM, and you can upload to your PACS, and your PACS will probably have different requirements regarding DICOM, every PACS does, but there are requirements for that. I mean, you can define what those are and then upload those. Um, a couple of other aspects, when you do the, the spike, when you outsource the, um, this process, as I showed here, there is an automatic spike detection aspect that doesn't allow for too much interaction. So if you were able to select your spikes and maybe not 250 spikes are going to fall into one cluster. Some of them are eh, not very sure about, it, but some of them are. So you probably potentially could select the ones you like. You could not select the ones you don't like, and that's based on physician interpretation. That'll be very, very helpful. Um, so that's one of the, the disadvantages of outsourcing this as compared to you know, doing it some degree of it locally. And then finally, ICTO onset, right? When you do your own source estimation, it's easy to define. Instead of a spike, you want to define a particular rhythm and you want to see the source of that rhythm at a given time, you can definitely do that. 
And if you outsource it, that's not something that it already um, is commonly used, right? It's usually mostly, um, commonly used mostly for spikes at the moment. So with this, um, next slide, Mary, please. I just wanna thank the folks here at my center who've done a lot of this work and over these seven years have trailblazed this, uh, this new technology with us, uh, Mallory, Todd, Amalia, and, so, and, and many others. So I really appreciate their help. So with this, I wanna conclude and thank you very much for having me on the panel.